Can't decide and torn between a romantic, comedy, action, or an indie film to watch for the weekend? Well, well, well. Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast is your ultimate guide to the latest movies. Join us as we dissect the latest on the blockbusters. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast. to the GSMC Movie Podcast, brought to you by GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Stacy, and today we are talking about two real-life story movies, Nothing to Lose and Bombshell, the Hedy Lamar story. So the first film, Nothing to Lose, um, as I normally do on the show, I went into it not knowing almost anything about it. I knew it was based on a true story. I didn't know what that story at all was about, but judging off the poster, I thought it might be a sort of um, redemption story, because in the poster, you see a man sitting in jail, reading, I think, a Bible, and so it's like, maybe he lived sort of a life of crime, and then found religion, or spirituality, or just a sense of goodness, or something in prison, that's not what it is, exactly. Uh, he, he totally found all that way long before prison. So, Nothing to Lose is based off of the real life of Adir Macedo, who is a, they call him a bishop, but I'm not sure if he's an actually ordained bishop, but he is a preacher in Brazil. And he is, I believe, like the world's wealthiest preacher or envelogist, tell envelogist, I can't say that word without tell in it, but uh, yes, someone who, you know, preaches the word of God to people and is very popular in Brazil. He actually once held an event on the same day as the Pope coming to the country and more people came to his event than actually went to the Pope. So that sort of gives you a, a sense of how well beloved he is uh, in the Brazilian Christian community. So uh, Nothing to Lose starts with him as a young boy watching a group of other young boys across the train tracks play soccer while he's just standing by himself. And there's something evidently about his hands. He has some sort of disability or something with his hands, but it's not quite clear what it is. It never really fully gets named when he's a young boy, it looks like he, his fingers are stuck together. But then when he's an older gentleman, it, his hand looks sort of gnarled and he can't quite hold the mic correctly. But it's never fully named what exactly is with his hands. But because of that, he feels sort of ostracized um, from everybody. And he wants to play with these young boys. So they challenge him, if you want to play with us, you have to climb that tree over there. So he takes up the challenge to climb this tree, um, but he gets sort of stuck and he calls upon God to help him, but he falls. And so he goes home and complains to his mother, you know, where was God? God wasn't there. He didn't answer my prayers. And she's like, that's because you weren't meant to climb trees. You were meant to climb mountains. And uh, that comes up later in the film. Then we see him progress a little more. He's now... A teenager, his sister has a very severe asthma and can't really breathe, but she tells him that when she listens to this radio program with a pastor on it, suddenly she feels okay and she feels like she can breathe. And so she wants to um, go to the church where this pastor is based to see him in, in person and ask uh, a dear to t go with her. And when he gets there, he feels sort of moved by this pastor and to see how well his sister looks and starts going regularly to this church um, and still sort of prays for God to 
to help him or to sort of make everything right in his life. And God still kind of doesn't answer at those moments, but he still feels moved enough to continue going to this church, um, which is the church where Esther, who will go on to be his wife, also goes. So years pass and they're now both older and Esther asks him to like help tutor her or something because he's really good at math. He works as a treasurer at the state lottery or something. Um, And he wants to be more involved with the church and he wants to go out. He says several times in the film to win souls for God, but the pastor doesn't believe he can and won't let him progress in the church uh, hierarchy. I'm not quite sure what to call it in the church sort of set up. Um, so by this time he's married Esther and his brother-in-law who's married to his sister has decided to start his own church and wants a deer to come and be the treasurer. And a deer's like, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to actually preach. He's like, well, you can do that too. So when a deer opens this church in like an old movie theater or something, very few people show up because it's a new church and it's in a crappy building and his brother-in-law and the man his brother-in-law is working with are not really happy about this because they feel they should be preaching to large crowds to like more than a hundred people or so anything less than a hundred is just you know nothing but Adir is really like if you can save one soul for God that's a good thing and that carries him through when he decides you know what I'm gonna quit my job and start my own church and Esther who's married to him they've had I believe one child by this point and maybe start to have a second one and their second daughter also uh, has, has a cleft palate. So that's something they deal with as well. Esther goes along with him in this plan to start his own church, even though he doesn't seem to have an actual real plan of how to pay for any of this. But Esther is also quite religious when they were starting to get married And as they go through trials in their marriage, God comes up several times of, you know, God will make a way, God will figure it out. This is a very religious film, if you couldn't tell. Um, So Adir does actually manage to start this church, and it gets quite successful because all the sort of regular people who don't feel like the mainstream churches really speak to him, really take to him because he originally started like just going out with a not a, I guess it's just a speaker and a mic and talking like in the middle of a park and he talks to everyone and he doesn't turn people away and he gets very, very popular and starts to build bigger churches and has a radio program and then takes over a television station and his word goes out and lots and lots of people come to him. But this bothers the main established, it seems Catholic church because there is definitely a, a Catholic and I apologize, I'm not a Catholic, so I, I, I'm i not sure what his rank is, but I'm going to call him a bishop also. There is a Catholic bishop who goes to the, um, he's the, he works in the government for like public somethings, goes to people in the government, is like, we have to stop this man. How can we, uh, how can we sort of make it legally hard for him to do whatever? He's not even an ordained bishop. He shouldn't be able to do this with all these people following him. So they try a couple of different ways to stop him and then eventually have him arrested. Um, And that's where we then get the picture of him in the jail with the Bible. Um, So yes, this film, I'm not, it felt very made for TV movie-ish. Um, like a made for TV movie on a religious channel, which I'm sure there are religious channels, but I don't, I couldn't name you one, but it felt sort of like that. The, um, the acting's eh, not terrible, but not great. This film is originally, I believe in Portuguese and I saw it when it was with English dubbing, uh, which was somewhat awkwardly done. And I'm just like, yeah, okay, dubbing. Could you really come in? But the version I saw for some reason had English dubbing but Spanish subtitles um, for a film that's originally in Portuguese. Um, but 
so basing off of the little bit of Spanish I remember, I could tell at times that I was like, yeah, that the way you dubbed this in English, it does not appear to be quite exactly matching what they supposedly really said. So who wrote the English script for this? Yeah. Netflix is somehow involved in this, and I'm not sure if this film is available on Netflix or will be available on Netflix. Um, if at all possible, you probably will want to see it more with subtitles than with the dubbing. The dubbing just felt a little weird, uh, especially when you could like see them up close. When it was just sort of speaking from afar, you could almost forget that, oh, hey, these aren't actually the words your lips are saying. But then there were times where they were up close and I was like, you you cut out like four or five words that you easily could have translated and put in there, but that kind of changes the meaning of the sentence and okay, whatever, just go on. Um, this just, it felt a little not quite preachy. I won't say that. It is supposed to be the story of his life, but if you are not a religious person, you may not like this film because of course, God comes up a lot. God is mentioned numerous, numerous amounts of times. And everything, it seems, is sort of left to God's hand with a deer's life. And it's just a little... I had a hard time because I'm like, okay, yeah, but a plan. Like, fine, but you still need a plan when you do that. But okay. And your wife, who has two young children, is like, Yes, we'll just leave it up, even though we don't have a way to, like, pay for the roof of our head. Uh, okay. I, again, I'm not a religious, so that that's a, that was a little hard for me watching that, just going, that's, that's not a plan of how to pay for food or anything. It's, um, I'm not quite sure. It's, it's both about religion, but it, it also is most definitely about a deer, a deer, excuse me, in that at first it seems almost not religious, when a deer is young and up to him, up to almost before we get to the final adult actor version of a deer, there's a lot of questioning of religion. And then even once we have the adult a deer, the pastor of the church he and Esther originally go to actually seems to be a bit of a bigot. A deer at one point brings a homeless man into the church because he wants to help him. And the pastor's like, this is not the place for that person. Um, and then his brother-in-law, you know, obviously only wants to preach to large crowds and doesn't feel about small crowds. And so it's just like, so it's about religion, but only religion is power except for a deer. And the charges that are brought up on a deer, if you don't have this sort of, from his point of view perspective, it's very clear to, it's very easy to see why these charges would be brought up because he does get super popular. Like I think he, he sells out stadiums to preach or something. And it's just like, you can just you can easily see how sort of corruption charges could be brought up against that and seem plausible if you yourself don't know the backstory for it. Um, I actually find the character of Astaire more interesting, and I do wish we got more of her because she's just sort of there for most of the film to be sort of his his support and his not not quite she's not there just to to be seen um he does sort of rely on her uh i want to say spiritually but i don't mean spiritually in the religious sense but in the sort of i need you here to keep my spirit strong as i go through these trials sort of way um but we don't really get a lot from her perspective we do get a number of things from adir's perspectives but then there's never really a time where we see her and see things going on in her life that a deer wouldn't know. The only time we really see her um, without him are like on the interns of things, like when he calls her or we stick with her for a moment after he's been arrested, when she's left, uh, they pull their car over in the middle of the street. So she's left with the car with their younger daughter as he goes off to jail but then we never see her in scenes by herself where he wouldn't, you know, necessarily know where she is or anything. Like she she does at one point have a job, but we don't even know what it is. And then the ending just felt 
the ending was very disconcerting. So uh, I should say there's sort of, in the version I saw, and maybe this is not in the real film, this might have just been for the film showings in theaters, you do get the actual Adir Macedo, um, who leads a prayer, and supposedly for certain events, you you were supposed to be given like a prayer sheet or something. Uh, that did not happen at the filming I saw, because I was literally the only person in the theater watching this film. Um, but clearly this is, an, there is the idea that, you know, church groups or what have you would go to this film. But then prior to that, when the, when it's still the actual film with the actors, you get this moment where Deer is woken up by a phone call from one of the people who works at the church. And it's like, they're doing something to the people who come to our church. And this might be the end of our church and using the music. And then the way a deer sort of looks off as that phone call ends, it felt like I was in a spy movie. <laughs> it felt like I was in like Mission Impossible or something. And we were clearly setting up for a sequel. And they do actually say nothing to lose too. you know, will be coming soon. And I'm just like, OK, fine, sequel. But what was with that change of tone out of nowhere? Like this was suddenly going to be become a spy action movie. I what? What, what, what are you what are you doing? I'm all, I'm left super confused at the end of this film just by that like last two minutes. Just okay, huh? So if you are a very heavily not even religious person, a very heavily Christian person, uh, you may like this film. You may find a lot out of it. Um, if you're not, otherwise, I'm not sure you might like this. The acting's not great. Esther is okay, but. Um, Adir is okay too, just it's not great acting. And again, if it's only available in dubbing, the dubbing is a little awkward at times. And then there is a set, a, a sequel that you supposedly have to watch. We do not end the story. We still have more to tell. So it, yeah, uh, make your own decision from there. So we're going to take a short break. Stay tuned. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Movie Podcast. Our second film today is Bombshell, the Hedy Lamar story. And unlike the first film, this is not an acted film, um, though I'm sure there have been versions that have actually been acted out and probably also made for TV. This is actually a documentary uh, about Hedy Lamar and her life. And it does start from her, well, it starts, you know, sort of a beginning of starting at the end. And then we do go back and talk about her childhood and her upbringing and the films she made before she came to America and her different marriages. And then after coming to America and her inventions, which is where the title comes from bombshell. And there is a, a picture of a torpedo on it. Um, because if you did not know, Hedy Lamar was an inventor who invented among other things, the idea of frequency hopping that was used to later the idea was for it to be used to make uh radio torpedoes where the signal could not be jammed but then it was later also used in things like wi-fi and cell phones and gps and going into this film i already knew that uh hedy lamar had invented something like that um and i actually couldn't i couldn't actually at the time have told you 
if I had seen a film of, her, of hers or not, I knew what she looked like. I knew she was this great beauty. And she really, like, she, she looks almost not real, very, very beautiful, almost you can't touch her sort of beauty. Um, but I did not know the more personal things like her different marriages and her kids and her later life and all of that. Um, the film tries to balance out between those two because Hetty is not just her inventions, but also this life that it's sort of portrayed, uh, not quite, uh, sad, but not fully happy at the end. It's somewhat resigned, not resigned. Um, just sort of, this is life and it could have been better, but it could have been worse. And this is how her life went. And this was the great woman she was. So um, we start with her uh, upbringing. Hetty was, her family were uh, secular Jews, I believe. Um, And she really loved her father. And her father was the one who sort of encouraged her sort of inquisitive mind. He would take her out and ask her questions about things. Like if they saw a, a, a train or a rail car asking, you know, how did you think that worked? And then they'd sort of follow it to, to figure it out. So she really sort of associated this scientific questioning inventiveness idea with her father who died when she was young. And then she, uh, went into pictures and made amongst other things, ecstasy, uh, which is the film that would sort of later cause her trouble and was was a very controversial film even when it came out uh, because there's she's swimming naked in the film at one point and she also sort of acts out an orgasm at one point in the film. And uh, she didn't, it seems that she didn't fully understand everything that she was being asked to do in ecstasy because at one point she they do have actual uh, recordings of her talking. She did several phone calls with uh, a reporter who is also interviewed in the film. And so she, she says at one point she didn't understand why the director like asked her to close her, her arms at one point and cover her face or something, not understanding what that was signifying, but then later got it. But ecstasy when it came out was condemned by both the Pope and Hitler and then when she later was a star in Hollywood, she was a, she was signed to MGM and they had a bit of trouble sort of turning that story around. She gave an interview once with Heather Hopper saying, you know, she hadn't wanted to do ecstasy. They really had to sort of portray that story as her being a young girl who was taken advantage of to to downplay the the sexiness and the controversy controversy, excuse me, of that story. Um, but then after her first few films made in Europe, uh, she was Austrian, I believe. She gets married very young. I think she's maybe 19 uh, to uh, Mendel, who is a weapons manufacturer and does make a number of weapons for the Nazis. And he was several years older than her. And he basically married her for her beauty. So she really served as little more than arm candy for him. Um, But he was very jealous and controlling of her. And she felt she couldn't breathe. And Austria at that time was, you know, becoming less and less a safe place, especially for Jews. So uh, one night, and I did not know this story at all, she takes a maid they have at the house who looks quite a bit like her and puts a sleeping pill or potion or something in the maid's tea to drug her and then switches clothes with the maids and takes as many jewels as she can and gets on her bicycle and rides away and eventually escapes to London, which at that time was a bit safer because the war had not yet come there. But she, while in London, meets uh, Louis B. Mayer of MGM And she chose MGM as sort of the company she wanted to work for movie-wise, she said, because she was impressed by the line roaring in the beginning. Um, But then you start to see 
her brain. Louis B. Mayer offers her a small amount of money. She refuses it, but then books passage on the ship he's taking back and sets things up so that he'll see, you know, everyone's affected by her. And so he'll want to sign her for more money. And then when the war starts, she really wants to help. And she's an inventor. And so she she and this man, Afiel, uh, get together to create, try and create an idea of a radio torpedo that can't be jammed. And they actually get a patent for this. And they give this pat- patent to the National uh, Inventors Council with the sort of understanding that if the patent's ever used, they would receive some financial reward for that because it's a patent. But the uh, military looks at this Thinks, so what are we supposed to do? Put a player piano on a torpedo because it was based off of player piano rolls. Uh, puts it in a drawer. doesn't do anything and tells that if she really wants to help the war effort, she could sell war bonds because she's a very pretty woman. And so people would be more likely to buy war bonds from her. So she feels a bit distraught by this, but does do it. And she actually ended up selling like roughly the equivalent of $343 million in today's value worth of war bonds but this is sort of not the first time but definitely a continuing thing of her being discounted because of her beauty she actually said at one point that uh any girl can look glamorous all she has to do is stand still and look stupid and i think she you can get it from the sense of the way people talk about her and the things she says on her own tapes that she felt people didn't and couldn't and wouldn't take her seriously at all because she was so beautiful and that her beauty was sort of a hindrance to her and even actually blocked her from the scientific career she probably would have preferred. But anyways, she goes through some sort of ups and downs, both career-wise. She's made a hit by the film Algiers, um, but then is later given just not really good parts by MGM. And so her career sort of falls. She is married a total of seven times. Um, and she loves at least one husband, but he's unfaithful to her. A couple only marry her for her beauty, and so she's just arm candy for them. She has one husband who she actually, because again, she's quite brilliant, uh, convinces to build a ski lodge in Aspen, which at that time was not the Aspen that we know of today. And this, of course, makes a lot of money. But then when they get divorced, her son has just been in a terrible car accident. So she doesn't want to leave him at the hospital. She sends her body double from the movies. And the judge is so infuriated by this that he punishes her and doesn't give her anything in the divorce settlement. So she really has a lot of ups and downs. Uh, She, like many stars at the time, was sort of put on drugs. Um, They were put on uppers to keep them awake and then put on downers at night to help them sleep. And they kind of got addicted to that. And so she, like many celebrities, uh, started using Dr. Philgood, who was an actual person, uh, a real doctor, who um, she was a patient of his from somewhere in the mid 50s to 1974 when he lost his medical license because he was, you know, drugging people. And he told them, you know, oh, hey, this is a vitamin B shot or whatever, when really it was like a shot of meth. So she has drug problems. She also later gets a number of plastic surgeries. Although, again, Hedy Lamar, very brilliant. Uh, It's actually revealed in this film that she was sort of one of the first people who had the thought of like putting the uh, facelift scars behind the ears so you couldn't see them. And she was really sort of innovative in plastic surgery. And then later, her plastic surgery turned out not as great. But she really had a lot of problems, especially later in life. She became very reclusive. She didn't want to be seen because she had been known so much for her beauty that when she became older and wasn't considered as beautiful, she really felt sort of the public turning away from her at that point. Um, So she didn't want to be seen outside. She didn't even really want to see her family because she felt that they also only really cared about Hedy Lamar and not Hedy, the real person whose last name is not actually Lamar. So she becomes a bit reclusive later in life. She does eventually try to find out what happened to her patent, which had actually been seized from her because she was not an American citizen. And it turns out that patent 
had actually been used, and it was used amongst other things to help create the sono buoy. Um, and it was used before the patent had expired, but she didn't know that at the time. They did not reveal that to her. And she only had a set number of years in which to sort of sue to get the money that was owed to her. And she didn't know that either. So she never actually got paid. And it's estimated that from all the things that use the technology she created, there's a current market value of about $30 billion. And she never got paid at all for that. So this is a very interesting film. It's nice to see uh, the different things. There's a good number of images, but also having the tapes where she talks for herself is really good. You do get interviews with uh, two of her children and then some of her uh, other descendants, grandchildren or what have you. Um, you also get interviews with uh, sort of outside people, the reporter who made the tapes on the phone call. And then you also have interviews with uh, Robert Osborne, who was with TCM, and this was actually, evidently, the last film he made before he died. So if you didn't already know the interesting thing about Hedy Lamarr and her inventiveness, this would actually be a really good film for that. If you did already know that, if you're still interested in like the personal aspects of her, yeah, maybe. Um, if you already kind of know more than half of her story... I'm not sure you'll get too much new information in this, but it's not a bad film, so it wouldn't hurt to watch it either. Uh, so we're going to end for today. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Movie Podcast. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program